guys? It's your boy GS Luke here for our DFS core picks for this week's Zurich Classic. In this video, we'll be covering my top six plays for large field GPP contests on DraftKings. The goal here is to give you some of the plays that I'll be building around in my player pool. And also, well, I'll be putting a lot of my money behind this week. First off, a recap of what we saw at last week's RBC Heritage, where Jordan Spieth came out and shocked the world. Even Jordan Spieth truthers like myself couldn't have possibly seen this coming. He was coming in with some of the worst form we've seen from him for frankly the last year, maybe even a year and a half. He hadn't made any putts to this point, and even at the Heritage, didn't make any putts. I mean, just ask the guy himself. He won that golf tournament without his putter. So truly incredible stuff. It took a few eagle hole outs. It took, of course, some stellar approach play from the guy, but congrats to anybody out there who was backing him. And of course, I didn't have any. I didn't see this coming at all. So it wasn't the best week for me on the DFS side, but if anybody's going to burn me, make me a less than profitable week, I'm okay with it being George Spieth. He's by far my favorite player in the world. So was actually a pretty solid week. I'm really happy to see that. Again, you guys know this if you've been watching the channel for quite some time. So hopefully you had a little bit of yourself out there. In other circumstance though, going to be talking about my core picks for this week at the Zurich, which is a little bit of a different animal. Of course, it's a team play event. You're dealing with pairs rather than individuals. So when you see the projections up on the sheet here, everything is going to be as a pair, whether it's a course fit, recent form, total model ranking, projections, Everything is going to be as a couple. So it kind of simplifies things by looking at it like that, but also takes a lot longer to do my analysis. So there's been quite a lot of legwork that has gone into this, and uh, I'm really proud of what I put together this week. So with that being said, let's go ahead and hop right on into it. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and start up top with our spend up option, which is going to be the pairing of Billy Horschel and Sam Burns, two guys that are used to swampy conditions. Billy Horschel being from northern Florida, Ponte Vedra Beach to be exact, so a swamp there at Sawgrass. And of course, Sam Burns, who went to LSU, who's also very familiar with this area. So in terms of their familiarity with each other, that's also a plus here. They played last year and finished in fourth place at this event. So it was their first time as a pairing. It went really well, and not a surprise to see that they're going up and teeing it up together once again. They're $10,000, so they are a little bit cheaper than some of the other 10K plus options. Also likely to be one of the lower owned options. I would expect Colin Morikawa and Victor Hovland to be by far the highest owned option this week, which definitely makes some sense. I'm going to ha have some ownership there myself, but in terms of a pure ownership play, in terms of a DFS fully fledged type of play, when you're considering strategy, ownership, game theory, everything like that, this is the play that I'm going to more often than not. Both of them extremely good with the putter, which is what you're looking for in this type of format. I guess to touch on some of the key stats, first off, looking at approach play, which shouldn't surprise anyone. But secondly, shots gain putting, especially on this Bermuda overseeded with POA surface, which we've seen for the last two, two and a half months at this point. We have Billy Horschel, who's been on absolute fire on these greens. And of course, St. Burns, who won over there at the Valspar, another course that has these exact type of greens. So like the putting for both of these players, in terms of their ball striking, very much so complimentary. I mean, Sam Burns does it with the distance. Billy Horschel, more of a precision guy. And into the greens, both of them really solid with the iron play. But where Sam Burns kind of lacks with the around the green play, Billy Horschel is more than enough to make up for it. So I like him there at $10,000. I like the fact that they have a complimentary skill set. You can see, I mean, taking an average of all their shots gain metrics over the last 50 measured rounds, they're gaining in all four categories, which is one of the only groups in all of the field to be able to say that. I mean, a few of the guys up top can as well, like a Patrick Cantley and Xander Shoffley, but they're also going to see a ton of ownership, right? But this Billy Horschel and Sam Burns group is also a juggernaut of their own, right? Gaining nearly a quarter of a stroke per round off the tee, nearly a quarter on approach. Gaining a little bit around the green, a little bit hurt by Sam Burns there, who's just a slight neutral there. But of course, gaining over half a stroke per round with the putter. I mean, just one of the best putting groups in the entire field. So absolutely love what I'm seeing from this pairing there. They have familiarity. They're from this part of the country. So they're used to playing in these type of conditions and have had success together in the past, right? If you take a look at their success at this event specifically, before they got together, wasn't all that great, at least for Sam Burns, right? Missed cut his first two times. Billy Horschel had won in the past, also finished 13th the year before he got together with Burns. But last year, we're able to right the ship and get back in the top five. So perhaps they're able to improve on that this time around. 
and punch through for a win. I would not be surprised at all, especially considering, first off, their familiarity, and second off, how complementary their skill sets are. The next group I'm going to is priced just below them at $9,700. This will be our second man in, which is going to be Ryan Palmer and Scotty Scheffler. You have the world number one, of course, who seems to be just underpriced, especially considering that Ryan Palmer isn't a slouch himself. Ryan Palmer is a winner at this event, has multiple really solid finishes. So let's go ahead and start there with Ryan Palmer. You can see last year finished seventh. That wasn't with um, Scotty Scheffler, ended up switching partners. Um, I forget who he was with last year. I believe it might have been John Rahm. Because every single time that Ryan Palmer has played this event, he's had like an insanely good partner. Actually, you no, know, he won with John Rahm in 2019. I'm not sure who he played with last year. I know it was another star-studded type of caliber player, uh, but he's had a ton of success at this event. And of course, you can say that the partners were a huge reason why that happened, but there's a 50-50 equation, especially on these alternate shot formats. So I definitely think that Ryan Palmer, at the very least, is a little bit better than most at this event. And he's paired up with world number one, right? If anything, that's an improvement when it comes to his playing partner. So at $9,700, I just expect them to be a little bit underpriced. And if you take a look at the shots gain metrics for the group, you can see they're gaining in every category but with the putter. So they're gaining a ton of strokes as a group off the tee, gaining a ton of strokes on approach, gaining around the green, and actually gaining in all four categories but just ever so slightly with the putter. A lot of that, of course, is due to Ryan Palmer, who's losing over half a stroke per round. But because Scotty Shuffler has been so good in that category, they are a slight positive. So it's one of the few groups, that's why I like them so much, that is gaining a across all four but the real key factor here is that they have complementary skill sets right Ryan Palmer a little bit more of a precision guy off the tee than a power guy whereas Scotty Scheffler is a huge power threat on approach both of them are pretty solid but of course Scotty Scheffler a little bit better than a Ryan Palmer around the green when Ryan Palmer's struggling let's say he goes through a few hole stretch where he's missing with his iron play Scotty Scheffler has been a wizard of late right gaining nearly two-thirds of a stroke per round with his around the green play and of course the putter has been there so Scotty Scheffler's more of course the guy that we're trying to ride here than anything but of course Ryan Palmer with all of his top finishes at this event in the past, I think are going to pay dividends and, of course, the experience, right? Scotty Shuffler hasn't played here all that often, just um, the one start here last time out, I believe. Um, yeah, just the one start here where he finished eighth place. So perhaps that experience can go ahead and guide him, particularly in the alternate shot format um, where a lot of headaches can definitely arise. Next up for our bread and butter play, we're going to have the pairing of Brendan Todd and Chris Kirk, who at $8,200 a very sneaky pick here. You can see in terms of my model ranking, I have him as the ninth ranked pick in the entire slate. So if we take a look at the shots gain profile, you see that they're very sneakily coming in as one of the underrated groups here. So a little bit off the tee they're losing, but gaining in all three categories except for that. Um, nearly a quarter of a stroke per round off this, um, on approach. Around the green is a huge plus for them and mostly the putter right gaining over a third of a stroke per round in both short game categories you would expect that from brendan todd and chris kirk right more of a plotter than anything and at this golf course that's only 7400 yards for a par 72 they can get away with their relative lack of distance but one thing to note here is that chris kirk has gained some distance he started to gain more significantly off the tee has always been very precise in that category but is now hitting the ball 305 310 yards per drive which is only about a five to seven yard difference from where he was hitting it before, but that's taking him from right around a neutral off the tee player to somebody that's able to gain over a third of each stroke per round. That's how precise he is there. So you can see it's complimentary because they're right around a neutral and it's all said and done there. On approach, of course, Chris Kirk has been a stalwart last week. Brendan Todd looked a lot better in that category. He was hitting a ton of greens at the RBC Heritage. And then the short game, he already outlined, is just insane for both of these players, both gaining significantly around the green and both gaining a ton with the putter, um, at least long term, right? Chris Kirk has had a few bad tournaments of late where he started to lose with the putter, but just take a look at the Florida swing. Take a look at the Players' Championship. The guy tamed gained a ton of strokes with the putter and of course those were on bermuda grass overseeded with poa greens the exact type of circumstance we're also going to have this week so at this $8,200 price tag, I just think they're being a little bit overlooked, especially when we consider some of the guys priced around them. Just people not coming in with relatively good form. You can see everyone, at least from a group perspective, has their flaw, you know, multiple, if not, you know, two to three categories where they're losing to the field. You know, whereas Brendan Todd, aside from losing just 0.038 shots off the tee, is gaining in all four categories. And of course, Brendan Todd, if he can tap into that accuracy this week, that's going to be a plus if they strategically use him on the right holes you know select him to tee off on the holes that are a little bit tighter whereas chris kirk can take advantage of that distance i absolutely love their chances this week so if they could stay on script could very well make a 
charge this week and uh, perhaps post something up there. Next up, we're going to have Brant Snedeker and Keith Mitchell, which is another group that really complements each other. You have Brant Snedeker, more of the short game specialist, somebody that can really fill it up on the greens. And then you have Keith Mitchell that is more of a ball striking specialist, extremely long off the tee, can get really hot with the approach play. And you can see when you take a look at their combined shots gain metrics, just losing on approach, which is a little bit surprising. You can see they're losing quite significantly, actually, where it's close to 0.15 shots gained per round. But just take a look at Brant Snedeker a few weeks ago where he led the field in shots gained tee to green. Keith Mitchell, of course, when he has it rolling, he gains a ton of strokes on approach. He's just extremely streaky. So while I don't think this is a safe play, this is a pure upside GPP large field tournament type of play where if you get both of these guys with their best stuff with the ball striking, both of them are extremely hot putters as well. You're looking at a group that could go out there and win this by four or five strokes. I just absolutely love the way that their games match up. I absolutely love the fact that they're streaky players and they're playing together. And when it comes to best ball, there's not going to be a better pairing. I mean, both of these guys are top five on tour when it comes to birdie or better percentage. Extremely aggressive players who, when you have that par in your back pocket with your partner is going to be a huge, huge, at least source of volatility, right? It's either going to go one way or the other. They're going to shoot something like nine or 10 under par, or they're going to shoot something like just one or two under par because they're just being a little bit too aggressive and kind of get burned by it. So absolutely love them in these large field events. They haven't played all that much together before. In fact, if we take a look at the record here, you can see that they did play here last year, ended up finishing fourth place, didn't play together in 2019. I don't believe they were playing together in 2018. They may have. If they did, they ended up missing the cut. So don't quote me on that. I don't know that one for sure there, but I know for a fact they played together last year and finished fourth. So just like a Billy Horschel, also Sam Burns ended up finishing in the top five last year. That at the very least is good to see, right? We don't know if that's going to last going forward because it is a small sample size. At least they have the familiarity. Both of them are from Sea Island. Obviously get a lot of practice rounds in together, being able to practice down there in Georgia. Um, and at $7,900, I definitely think they have some upside. And now for our value pick, we're going to have Austin Smotherman at $7,100 playing alongside Harry Higgs. This is another case of a group that has a complementary skill set. You have Austin Smotherman, the ball striker. The guy gains a ton of strokes off the tee on approach. And then you have Harry Higgs, who loses a ton with his ball striking and is a around the green and putting specialist. So if you take a look at their shots gain metrics all around, you can see they're gaining off the tee, also gaining on approach mostly due to Austin Smotherman, to be honest with you, where he's gaining four tenths of a stroke per round off the tee and six tenths of a stroke per round on approach. Uh, obviously, Harry Higgs, not the best ball striker in either category, but around the green, you can see Harry Higgs is right around a neutral player. And with the putter, he starts to gain in particularly at the Masters and last week at the RBC Heritage. Harry Higgs is starting to turn it around. So if he's going to be that short game specialist, if Austin Smotherman is still going to be this ball striking phenom. I mean, at this point, the guy's putting up Justin Thomas numbers with his ball striking stuff. Um, this could be a group to look out for. And again, it could go one way or the other. This is a group that's going to be extremely volatile. Both of them high birdie or better percentage players, but also high bogey percentage players. Uh, I just like them in these large field tournaments where we're looking for that upside. Of course, they've never played together. Austin Smotherman, a PGA Tour rookie, has of course never played here in the Zurich Classic. But if you take a look at Harry Higgs here, he played here last year and missed the cut. So not many people are going to be going to him. They're going to be looking too much into that because now he has a different partner, right? Somebody who's never played in this event on tour. And considering that Austin Smotherman is the ball striker, Harry Higgs is that short game specialist we're looking for. I just think that that skill set upside is what I'm looking for. I mean, if you take a look at some of the groups here, I mean, it's like Adam Shank, Tyler Duncan, um, not really what we're looking for. I mean, Matt Wallace, same horse field, not really in good form either of them. Just no one really sticks out here. But if you take a look here, you have two flashy names in Smotherman and Harry Higgs who have elite skill sets, but just at different things, right? Which is what I'm looking for, at least. I know some people this week are looking for players that have similar skill sets. But an alternate shot, you can't take advantage of that, right? You can't hit two approach shots on the same hole. Whereas if you hit a really good approach shot and your other player's really good at making putts, you can start to take advantage of that. You can start to get some momentum going there. So um, that's what I'm trying to target this week. And that's why I do like the combination there of Smotherman and Higgs. And now, lastly, for our diamond in the rough, our pure flyer pick is going to be the combination of Par Barjan and Tom Hoagie, who 
If you guys have been following the channel here, you know that their ball striking numbers are just immaculate. Both of them gaining significantly off the tee. You can see on approach, Barjan a little bit more inconsistent, but Tom Hoagie, of course, is gaining in bunches. In fact, just a few weeks ago, he's gaining close to three quarters of a stroke per round with his approach play over his last 50. It's kind of cooled down a little bit, has posted a few rounds of just slightly above average approach play, which is a little bit concerning, but now he gets paired up with another ball striker, somebody who is also decent around the green, right? Just slight losers in that category. If there's one thing you can get away with this week, it is not being very good around the green just because you're dealing with relatively flat greens. They're only running at 12 on the stint meter, not the most difficult shots around the green. They're also not elevated because you're in a swamp. So it um, takes away a little bit of the difficulty there and both not the best with the putting. And that could certainly be a problem because you're looking at a winning score between 20, maybe 25 under par. But you're also talking about a 7K golfer. And one thing's for sure about this field is when we get below, let's say even $7,500, it gets really, really ugly. I mean, there's the talent of players here um, is usually what we see in like the 62 to $6,300 range. And once you get below $6,600, you're talking about guys who we hardly ever see, period, on the PGA Tour. People who literally have never had status on tour before, um, or at the very least haven't had it in the last two to three years. So um, just trying to make sure that we can target the value here in the top of the 7K range is going to be a little bit more sustainable. So that's why he's going to be the lowest pick here. I should say they are going to be the lowest pick here that I'm going with, at least in terms of a core pick, because when you get lower on the board here, there's guys that you just literally can't take. There's maybe one to two flyer picks below $6,500 I'll be willing to take this week, but a majority of my value will be here at $7,000. So of course, when it comes to lineup construction, that does mean that I'm going to be a little bit more balanced this week than I would be in most weeks. Um, but that's just a product of the player pool, right? You just got to play to the you know cards that you've been dealt. Um, and in this case, it's just not a very good hand down low. We take a look at some of their success. Of course, Barjan's never played at this event. I believe Tom Hoagie's never played here too. No, he actually has. I missed the guy here last time out, 34th in 2019, 10th, 24th. So of course, has never played alongside Barjan. Um, has at least made the cut in three of his four times here. So um, maybe he has a little bit of a propensity to play well at these events because he's a little bit more laid back of a guy. And if Barjan ends up being a good fit for him, which with the ball striking numbers, it seems like he might end up being a pretty solid fit. Could be a nice value there at $7,000. That's all I've got for this week's DFS core picks. Before you go on and get out of here, go ahead and let me know down in the comments who you've got winning this thing. For me, I'm going to take Sam Burns and Billy Horschel. Just love the combination. Like the fact that they finished top five in their first ever performance together. And both are trending. Of course, Burns with the win. Horschel with a bunch of top 25 finishes. But go ahead and let me know who you've got down below. Going to have DFS value picks coming out tomorrow morning. So make sure to keep an eye out for that. Also, our fades and sleepers. DFS ownership will be on Patreon tomorrow at some point. So if you're part of that, make sure to go ahead and check that out. Of course, if you haven't already liked the video, make sure you go ahead and do that. If you haven't already subscribed, make sure you go ahead and do that as well so you don't miss any of that content to come in the future. I appreciate all the support here, guys. Until next time, best of luck with all of your bets, all of your DFS lineups this week, and let's get this cash.